Hey folks, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so this is, as Katie mentioned, demystifying SRE and DevOps. And I need to advance my slide. There we go. Um, now, I want to get this out of the way. I am a, uh, I work for Datadog. Um, I assume that most of you are familiar with it, um, but we do rely on SRE very heavily. Um, we have a very strong DevOps culture and we have had quite a road in implementing SRE in our in our space. Um, losing focus here. Come on. Well, while my machine decides to uh, take a nap and, uh, and give me the swirly beach ball, there we go. So my slides have finally caught up. All right. Um, in really short, Datadog's an observability platform that provides full visibility across your organization. Uh, we span end-to-end -end from your infrastructure network to your applications and services, all the way to your end users. Um, and this enables everyone, uh, operations, development, security, really anybody in the business to have a shared understanding of your systems um, and the ability to immediately resolve problems when they arise. Um, but that's really all I'm gonna talk about the company itself today. Um, my goal for our time today is to clear up any confusion about what DevOps and SRE are, some tools and practices that will help you on your DevOps journey, and the kinds of people that can help improve your engineering efforts, uh, as well as suggestions for incorporating SRE practices in your organization. Now, you may be wondering who this bearded beauty is and why he's qualified. Hi, I'm Waldo. I used to be a productive member of society before I took this job, but I come from the systems and operations engineering world. Before accidentally going to the right conference, I was a fairly typical bitter sysadmin type. Um, the DevOps community was still pretty new, uh, but attending Velocity in 2011 was revelatory for me. That week literally changed my career. I'd simply never been in, or in an organization that didn't have a contentious and often even antagonistic relationship between the people who make things and the people who keep them running. Now, since we're here, I should explain by what I mean by DevOps. DevOps is a professional and cultural movement that focuses on openness, sharing, and mutual respect. It seeks to improve the lives, uh, the quality of life for its adherents, for your company and for your customers. DevOps addresses the situation where a lot of effort is spent on the development of features, but the operation of those features, making them actually available to their users, historically has gotten very little investment from the business. But availability is the one feature that any application needs, and that's driven by its reliability. But by the nature of most organizations, the people who write features don't figure in reliability, largely because the impact of that reliability historically is, hasn't been felt by them. Now, there is a, an acronym with a couple of variants that is helpful to describe some of the core tenets of DevOps, uh, CAMS. This stands for Culture, Automation, Metrics, and Sharing. Sometimes you'll see CLAMs or COMs with the addition of L for learning. But look, I'm going to go through these very briefly. Culture asks us to be conscious of the culture that we're creating and participating in at, at work. Automation's focus is to reduce toil and making steps repeatable, less risky, and freeing people up to do more interesting work. We care about measurement or metrics so that we can see the impact of our changes and how successful they are. And sharing encourages us, encourages us to be radically open about our failures as much of, as much as our successes. And if you want to include the L, learning requires a degree of self-awareness as well as being receptive to feedback, um, admitting when something doesn't work and changing it. Now, despite dev and ops being part of the name, it isn't just about those two roles. DevOps is literally about the entire business, 
encouraging everyone to be aware of their roles in the business and that their work is aligned with the business's goals. So honestly, there's no need to awkwardly add to th uh, add things to the word DevOps. Um, adding QA or security or net is unnecessary. They're, they're already included. We've lost the battle that DevOps is not a job title, given how popular the recruiting for that has been. Um, I think this band has one of the best titles in the world. Um, I mean, one day I aspire to be a Rasputin impersonator, but that's neither here nor there. Technically speaking, it's not really any different than what excellent systems or operations engineering has been historically. There's, but there is no such thing as DevOps tools. And if you have a team called DevOps, well, uh, I'll address that later. I say all of that because it's nearly impossible to describe SRE for site reliability engineering without an understanding of DevOps. SRE is a set of practices and it can be a job description. It could also be said that DevOps is an idea where SRE is an implementation. When the Google book, uh, when the SRE, when the SRE book was published in 2016, many of us were a bit surprised to see that it looked a lot like Google branded DevOps. Ultimately, SRE is the idea of how Google, in isolation, addresses the problems that the DevOps community was working on. I'll describe the skills to look for later, but in short, the people best suited to this are developers with an operations mindset or ops folks with software skills. In order for DevOps and SRE to be most effective, you need to consider how your organization is structured. Now, it's almost not a uh, culture talk if I don't bring up Conway's law, which is an adage that says organizations which design systems are constrained to produce des designs which are copies of their organizational structures of, of their orgs. This immediately makes most people think about their org chart. And they're not wrong, but the key word is communication. If you have a typical org chart where development and operations are distinct groups, they're very likely to have conflict because they have opposing goals. Development is rewarded for rapid change and operations is rewarded for stability. This is where we disambiguate bet uh, between reporting structures and communication structures. Let's take two hypothetical teams at an e-commerce site that interact with one another. Say a team that works on the inventory products and one that works on the shopping cart functionality. Now let's say the management of these two groups don't work well together. It's not active fighting, but friction. If the two teams don't have any other interaction outside of their management, then communication is minimal and the likelihood of misunderstandings will be high and it's unlikely that their software will perform well. If, for instance, members of the inventory and shopping cart teams have lunch together regularly, they're much more likely to have an easier working relationship with each other. And the quality of their software's interaction is going to reflect that. Now, it's not great that their management doesn't work together well. Um, they might, the in, individuals on those teams might not be getting the support and knowledge that they need. But the fact that they do have a communication structure in place does improve the quality of their software and thus the customer experience. A popular theme in DevOps and SRE is the breaking down of silos. The metaphor usually refers to grain silos, but in some organizations, missile silos may seem more appropriate. But a common misstep has been to rename their operations team to DevOps effectively changing nothing else, and then be dis disappointed in the results that didn't emerge. Another common misstep is to create a dedicated DevOps team that sits between development and operations. But this in effect is just creating another silo. In my opinion, the organizational paradigm that works best is what's called the product team. Um, you may also hear this called, uh, referred to as service teams. In this model, uh, self-contained cross-functional teams are created to solve the business needs they're tasked with. In addition to the team producing the software needed to solve the problems, they also operate those solutions. 
this applies to build versus buy as well. The fact that a team operates its own solutions is a key fact and feature of product teams. Um, you may have heard this referred to as you build it, you run it. This ultimately improves reliability and reduces recovery times because the feedback loop between an identified need uh, to the deployment is drastically reduced. In other terms, responsibility is aligned with authority and capability. In addition to organizing your employee structure around products, you should also consider having them seated by their product. Um, you know, back when we had offices. <laughs> uh, but when teams are developing and operating their own products, they're going to experience a variety of problems. But when you're in close proximity, they'll have a they'll have a greater breadth of experience and skills uh, to bring to bear to come to solutions. Further, by having people with similar skills solving different problems uh, in proximity to each other causes distraction and a less diverse field of insight. Um, I could go on ad nauseum about this, um, but we're gonna keep this short. When you pursue the product team route like Datadog has, you may feel that the sharing of information around people with similar skill sets may be lost. Uh, to that end, Datadog has, has the concepts of squads and goals, which are sub-communities that cross our product team boundaries. A squad is a short-term group that organizes around a single goal, um, often an OKR, that wouldn't fit neatly on an existing team or it benefits a large number of teams. Um, previous examples have included topics such as recruiting and analytics and even organizing around next hackathon. A guild owns and shepherds an important part of our architecture or culture that crosses many teams. Guilds are larger and semi-permanent versions of a squad. Um, previous examples of this have included front end and on call. Now, unfortunately, Datadog does not have fantastic hats. Uh, I am lobbying for this internally. I'll let you know how we come uh, next time we see each other. Now, as opposed to a DevOps team, you might actually want to stand up a SRE team. Uh, this is one way that SRE is distinct from DevOps. Now, that said, there are different ways that this may take form. So, you could have a team of SREs who's, for instance, they, they do code reviews or they assist in incident management or they fil uh, facilitate postmortems. Uh, you may have an, engine, a, an SRE on that team who supports a dedicated portfolio of teams or products. Um, they may even be on individual product teams. And Another way to slice this would be to have individuals rotate on different teams, say like on a per, uh, per week or sprint basis, um, and maybe helping out with dedicated like bug hunt sprints. Datadog does all of these uh, in one way or another. We do have SREs who are permanently on teams. We do have teams of SREs. Um, we're, we are continually experimenting with with how this works um and it's going to depend a lot on on your specific company your culture and the people that you have available to you but now i want to talk about tools um, these are a set of tools that you should be pursuing if you don't have them already um, and very few of these are actually software many of them are are really ways of thinking so upfront, you have to acknowledge that change is hard, it will take time, and it probably won't work at first. Um, you may have successes, but it won't be the full-blown, uh, it, it won't be the, the raving success moonshot that you're hoping for. Um, having a mindset that failure is the first step to success is greatly going to help you in your transitions. While Big Bang grand reveals can be satisfying, they're more difficult to get right, and they're hard, uh, harder to diagnose when things go wrong. Uh, this is part of the continual iterative improvement mindset. 
getting in the habit of small releases and of showing your work earlier to elicit feedback um, and running experiments helps keep projects on the rails. And ultimately, it drives toward more satisfactory outcomes. Um, this is something that I have a problem with myself. I, I love the philosophy, but I find it hard to do myself, showing getting feedback earlier in the process. Now, I'm not saying that you need to do test-driven development here, um, but it is a great framework for ensuring that the development of a has a degree of verifiability before it goes anywhere. Um, wrapping testing into the integration and merging process removes a lot of potential for faults. More importantly, these tests need to be reliable. Having tests that sometimes fail or need to be written more than once are brittle and fixing that should be prioritized. Now, uh, much is being said about observability. Um, quite simply, observability doesn't replace monitoring. Observability is an adjective. It describes a property of your software. Monitoring is the act of watching your events and metrics for problems. These two things are not mutually exclusive. Additionally, there should be a relationship between the application testing in your CI and your monitoring. They don't need to be a one-to-one -one relationship from tests to monitors, but it should ensure that success is being measured the same, both in development and at runtime. So having a conscious decision, um, who receives pages or alerts? Um, has that ever been a decision that was consciously made or was it just an assumption put in place? Are, there, are the people who receive the alert the people who can resolve the issue? And is any effort made to find and fix repeat incidents? So postmortems are a lot of fun. Uh, when something goes wrong, what happens? Do you collect lessons learned um, and do you publish those to any degree? Are remediation items published and prioritized? Um, do you only do after action reviews when something goes wrong? Or do you also uh, run them when things go right? Now, the resulting outcome from a postmortem should almost never be someone being fired with malicious intent being the rare exception. Human error might be a cause but it's the beginning of the postmortem, not the conclusion. If a human erred, it's important to find out why they thought what they were doing was the right thing to do. Was there a cognitive disconnect between how they thought things worked and how they actually work? Um, if it was something like a typo, it's possible your, your environment could use some tooling interfaces with better guardrails. Um, examples of this are like the AWS S3 outage last year, where more instances cycled than was desired because of a typo. Or when uh, Hawaii's public broadcasting, uh, Hawaii broadcast uh, a pending nuclear missile warning erroneously because of, uh, because of a missed click. So if you recall your Frank Herbert, fear is the mind killer and for this reason, it's important that your postmortems aren't retributive. For one, people will be loath to admit their mistakes if their job and their reputation are on the line. When you have an incident, it has incurred some cost. Um, but if you fire somebody for making a mistake, you'll derive nothing from the failure and no, no good learning will have happened. This is one way that you can directly embrace the ideas of iterative improvement. Now, uh, personally, I don't get too excited about microservices. Um, I think it's a doubling down on SOA. I don't think monoliths or macroservices or microservices are inherently good or bad. Um, I prefer that apps are small and interconnected, uh, interacted with over web protocols, but I wouldn't be the one to tell you that it's mandatory. That said, SOA does align nicely with the goals of a DevOps organization. They make it very easy to align people with products which align to business goals. And when you have a, a versioned and documented API for your service, you can innovate responsibly 
by incrementally releasing new features that change behavior without breaking your existing contracts. And with proper monitoring, you can responsibly target things for deprecation. What's important is that your architecture makes it easy for, your, uh, for you to draw team responsibility boundaries and that it's, san it's a sane and easy way to update and deploy your services. Now, uh, uptime is a poor measure of reliability. When uptime is the core metric that you evaluate on, it's gonna drive behaviors that optimize for that metric. Um, unfortunately, this often includes slowing down in innovation because your engineers don't wanna make changes. Zero deployments will lead to less downtime, but that's almost certainly not an outcome you want. Um, agile developments fail fast approach coupled with distributed applications and dynamic infrastructure requires us to have a better understanding of reliability. Service level objectives, SLOs, are a, they're a measurement of how reliably you plan to run your new service. SLOs also help you understand the true health of your systems um, and how your end users experience them, as well as leaving you with room to innovate. Without SLOs, you may be measuring the wrong thing by understanding how your customers experience your service. A result of defining SLOs, your engineers have pre-approved error budgets already defined as room to experiment and innovate. Um, SLOs are, are an involved topic, and for the time being, I'm going to defer to another talk on the topic. Um, Jennifer Petoff is one of the editors of the SRE book. Um, a key takeaway for me was realizing that 100% of time is impossible, and that not all of your services need to be run with maximum availability. Keeping that in mind, you can't run a 4.9 service that's dependent on a 3.9 service without making some very significant uh, engineering decisions. Now, the last tool I want to talk about is that you should default to open within the company. Um, metrics, dashboards, docs, um, they allow every, having them open allows everyone to use the same information when making decisions. Um, for instance, your, your application and service status endpoints um, and publishing SLO status widgets. Uh, these are all ways to democratize information so everybody can, everybody's working from the same information. Now, I believe the last, uh, last topic I talk about today is incorporating SRE. Now, <laughs> A common question that, that I hear is, uh, you know, how do we do, how should you do it? How do we do it? Uh, standalone team or individual role, or what's the skill profile? Um, and I hate to give a, an it depends answer, but it depends uh, mainly on the talent and the personalities that you have access to. Let's assume that you're willing to try different modes and are willing to attempt multiple experiments despite the failures and successes you encounter. By that, mean, uh, by that, I mean a single experiment isn't going to assure repeatable success or failure. Now, as much as I'd love to give you a definitive right way, it just doesn't exist. Um, however, these experiences will allow for plenty of topics for papers and other conference proposals. Now, uh, here are some common skills and characteristics of SREs that we found in, uh, especially in Datadog. Um, having an operations head with a developer skills or a developer who has ops experience. Um, they're often master code reviewers. They tend to be operationally cynical, um, meaning that it works on my machine isn't going to come naturally to them or that network latency is a thing uh, that the the speed with which you can interact with a database or a message queue running on your developer machine is not going to give you the same experience as working in production uh, SREs tend to solve operations problems with software 
Um, they're often autodidacts and polymaths, um, meaning they that not knowing something isn't usually a it doesn't stop things. It may be a temporary blocker, but they're they're happy digging in. Um, now, every job description I've ever seen has had communication in it, uh, but SREs need to be able to communicate with a very wide variety of of people and experience. They SREs also tend to to be natural teachers or mentors, um, and all the best ones I know have a very high degree of humility. Um, they know that they, as much as they have seen, they haven't seen it all, and they can be wrong. Now, the bad news is that this set of skills, uh, never mind the additional technical chops, does not exist in a single person, um, and never mind being able to field a team full of these people. The good news is you can save a lot of time and effort trying to hunt that unicorn. You're going to want to plan to have a, um, people of widely divergent experience and, and skills to support and train one another. Now, uh, some of the pitfalls to, uh, to implementing, dev, uh, implementing SRE in your organization. One, you need to have some patience, have some grace with yourself. change is hard and inertia is difficult to overcome change is going to take time and the appearance of progress is going to seem very slow agonizingly so but stating your intended goals repeatedly um, try to avoid platitudes but uh, stating explicitly that you intend to change and that you can't change by continuing to do the same things just as there's no DevOps in a box, you can't just go buy yourself some SRE. Um, a personal rant of mine is I largely despise technical standards within, uh, within companies like you must use this language and this framework and things like that. Um, the, I think people should avoid um, centers of excellence and other forms of ivory tower thinking. Uh, I think they're, they can be fun to work on, but they're frustrating to have to live with because they are often thinking in terms of problems that you don't have. So they're fine when they work with you, uh, but as soon as it starts providing friction, it becomes no fun. Um, it tends towards dogmatism and arguments about following the standard. Um, personally, I with the product team, uh, the product team paradigm, it allows individual teams to be autonomous. They get to own their own destiny and live with their mistakes or and successes. Now, uh, I have a side rant of best practices versus lessons learned and after action, but again, uh, that's that is another talk for another day. Now, depending on your industry and the particular parts of your applications, um, depending on the rules and regulations involved, not all teams will be able to use all the features uh, of a modern team, or they may have to perform things in a specific way in order to be compliant. Um, for instance, if you have uh, your regulatory restrictions, don't allow the person to write code, approve it and deploy it, have a conversation with your editor there are a lot of assumptions about what regulatory restrictions say that are incorrect. And in my experience, most auditors are happy to engage and talk about um, like ABA and ABC scenarios and where and when a piece of software may take the place of a human as, as one of those entities. Um, now, keeping that in mind, don't handcuff the teams that this doesn't apply to. Isolate things that involve like payment processing or PII um, and things like that from the requirements of the rest. Don't you know, isolate, isolate the boundaries of where those restrictions have to be used and from where they don't need to be. Um, a, a personal 
a personal horror of mine is the matrix organization. This is where any given individual uh, individual ha has a reporting structure within their technical, their functional roles, as well as a product team. Don't do this. Um, just the problem is that it at least doubles, if not squares, the amount of leadership uh, that your individual contributors have to deal with. Um, you're, it's fine if everybody's playing by the same rules, um, but it's just, it's not good. Don't do this. Um, look more towards product teams and guilds. Um, if you, if you want to maintain that from a, from a culture perspective, but don't do it for reporting structures. Now, um, patience again, you absolutely have to have patience with this process. Now it's unfortunate that some people are going to, would prefer to depart rather than change. Um, and some of the people who make the decision to leave are going to surprise you. And some of the people who get on board, uh, likewise, you may not ex have expected. Um, also openness is scary and it's not the habit of most companies, but openness, especially around failure is what makes all of this work. Failures and mistakes are learning opportunities and firing somebody who makes a mistake means you've wasted however much that mistake cost. Um, again, a firing should almost never occur unless it's something particularly egregious, intentional, or that person refuses to learn. And finally, your mileage will vary. Keep in mind that Google's solution won't solve your problems. Probably. What makes Google's solutions work at Google is dependent on the entire ecosystem of what comprises it. That's to say you won't instantly have Google success by doing what Google says they do without very careful consideration. Um, asking what, what can I do to achieve that result is more helpful than asking what did Google do. Google's problems are not your problems, except in the very abstract. Um, now, not everybody there uh, would recognize what's described in the SRE book. Now, I'm not being critical of Google when I say this, um, but some of the content could be graciously called aspirational. Even at the time of the writing of this book, not all of their teams worked in the ways described. Now, keep in mind that this book was published in 2016. I would never bet that things had, hadn't changed in the four years since. Um, and also, I'm not bagging on Google uh, or the book. I, I think I, I think the book is excellent. I think that the it's recommended reading for everyone just to have an idea of uh, have some ideas of how they'd want to run teams better. Now, uh, in our time today, I've attempted to clear up any confusion about what DevOps and SRE are, tools and practices that will help you on your DevOps journey, uh, the kinds of people that can help improve your engineering efforts, and suggestions for incorporating SRE practices into your organization. With that, I want to thank you for your time and attention. I hope this was helpful, informative, and gives you some ideas of how to improve your own organizations. With that, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna turn, take a look at questions. Yeah, so um, Waldo, there is there was one in the chat to request to go back to a slide that was about the all day DevOps. Ah, yes. Just so they could look at that a little bit more. Uh, oh, sure. In courses, and then uh, we can go through, there are a couple questions in the Q&A chat. Yep, let me. This one, I believe. All right, so uh, are you looking at Q&A or the chat widget? So the chat, I think we're good on that one. I didn't see any other questions from there. So now okay. 
the Q and A. Um, how can you easily democratize information when the majority of SaaS vendors or software as a service vendors for monitoring observability charge per seat? I'm not sure how to answer this. Um, it has to be, well, now I'll, it, my knowledge is going to be imperfect of how pricing goes across the industry, but I, in my recollection, most charge by, by like server instance or or processes things like that um that's an interesting question there are now one way that actually i i don't really know how to answer that without knowing the specifics and uh i generally don't talk about other <laughs> other uh, monitoring SASs other than datadog um so it's not a not something I can answer well, um, but I'm sure that you could come up with creative solutions around that. Um, but again, I yeah, I don't really have a good way to answer that, unfortunately. Um, but I want to thank you for the question, Mauricio, and I hope I said that right. Um, <laughs> so uh, his next question is also from. Again, I hope I say this right, Mauricio. Um, related to what I said about resisting technical standards, uh, what are my thoughts about following best practices? I I have a complicated relationship with the phrase best practices um, because one person's best practice is another person's definitely don't do it this way. I think it's an easier or it's a slightly less dogmatic way of doing it. Um, I like recommended practices because they're not trying to say that, you know, plant a flag in the ground saying, this is the best way to do it definitively. Um, this is what I recommend. This is the way, what works for us. Um, I hope that helps. Um, I think it's a slightly less dogmatic way of coming to the same thing by claiming something's a best practice. Um, it's another one of those things where your mileage will vary. So again, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, uh, the next one that we have is, how do you suggest implementing products and service teams in an organization that has relatively few dev and op staff and relatively many discrete services, I e or e.g. about 30 staff members and greater than 100 services? <laughs> So drawing it, so this sounds like a either an understaffed company or a, a lot of microservices, in which case um, I can't help you with the understaffing thing. Um, as far as doing um, like drawing team boundaries, um, I think it's just a matter of assigning logical correlations between it, actually, it doesn't even need to be logical correlations. Your team can be responsible for a bunch of discrete services that have little to do with one another, um, but making sure that there is ownership of these products. I mean, it helps to think in terms of um, like we are in charge of shopping cart functionality, whether you run one service to do it or you do it in 50 or 100 services to, to achieve your goals um that is just a matter of choosing which services belong to any given team um now with 30 stat like yes it's in this in this situation you may have say like five or six teams and all of them are in charge of like 15 to 20 applications that's actually not terrible um, especially if they're relatively low touch uh, applications. Um, but just having ownership is is more important than quantity, uh, like how how wide your portfolio is. 
So I hope that answered your question, Mike. All right. And then let's see. Would avoiding a matrix organization imply reporting to someone on your same team? If so, how do you avoid conflicts of interest in things like code review when your manager is also an approver? Okay, uh, so I have, a, I have very strong feelings about this. Um, it, avoiding matrix organizations me, means that when you're, when you're working in a product team, the you don't use the functional leadership paradigm anymore, like a um, operations uh, operations director or uh, development manager. Um, the key role for deciding what work gets done is the product owner, the product team lead. Um, so conflicts of interest, I'm not sure what you mean by that unless you're referring to um, what's it called? Uh, regulatory restrictions. But the, yeah, I'm not sure. How do you avoid conflicts of interest in things like code review when your manager is also an approver? Um, so I see these in different things. Uh, you probably have something very particular in mind. Um, and I'm not sure that I've got it in my head what, how to address the situation. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me and uh, I'd be happy to have more of a conversation around it um, because I'm fairly certain that I don't, under, I don't have a good picture of your situation. <laughs> 